Take your Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 1, and uh, I hope that you're going to be able and willing to engage with me a little bit tonight as we look at uh, the scriptures. And uh, I, uh, I went to bed last night, I don't know how you did, really at peace. It, it, whatever the outcome is going to be politically, I was at peace because I know that our times are in God's hand, aren't they? And it doesn't mean that we don't have a, a vested concern, uh, but my concern is more that our nation would be a nation that would see revival. Uh, I don't know how you feel about that as you look at our society, but I so long for our nation to be a nation that turns its heart back to the Lord. And so that's my, my thought for tonight. And I hope that it will be a blessing to you. And so here's a question I, I put forward, and it is this. Will America find her way back to God? I think a lot of people are looking at the change of administration, and they're thinking, okay, wow, we get to start over. Actually, you don't get to start over. Uh, Things continue to move, right? The world continues to wax worse and worse, and it, and it continues down that path. At times, it might be somewhat, uh, what would the word be, retarded, uh, drawn back a little bit. But we forget how far we've moved. If, we, if, if I could pick up this congregation tonight, and we would transplant ourselves back to Oh, let's say 1950. All right, so we go, boom, we're in 1950. It's quite a different world. Values are different. Culture is different. Uh, the uh, fundamentals of our faith are well known. But we don't live in 1950. We live in a culture that is, uh, is in many ways accelerating towards evil. And maybe we slowed down a little bit, the throttle. But we forget how far we've already gone, and it hasn't been a good path. So let me uh, present to you, and I hope you uh, will engage with me a little bit tonight. Let me turn this on here. There, there it goes. It is on. All right. Here's for your outline. And it is the morality, or you might could say the righteousness of a nation, determines its destiny. And then this verse, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness, justice, abiding by the law exalts a nation. And of course, that law would be God's law, right? His law, his word, his commandments. And so Solomon, as he's teaching his son, who's going to be the king, he says, son, righteousness will lift up, it will elevate, it will build, it will strengthen a nation. But then he went on and he cautioned, but sin is a reproach to any people. Uh, the word reproach could be is a disgrace. Here's a thought for you. How many disgraceful things have we witnessed in the last 10, 15 years? Things that probably 15, 20 years ago would have had you arrested. And now they are accepted in public. Sin has become something that has been accepted, if not embraced. But God's word doesn't change. And it is a shame to a nation that embraces sin. And only righteousness will exalt that nation. Here's my, my point to you. It doesn't matter what the promises of a politician might be. Only God builds the house. Right? And they labor in vain that build it apart from him. Here's another thought then to go on your outline. And my, my thought with this, and not a quote, just something I wrote down. Regardless of who is in the White House 
or what party controls the U.S. Senate or House of Representatives. America will not be great until its citizens turn to God and the scriptures become the basis of our laws and conduct. Would you agree with that? Now we know the next step, obviously, is to see in Christ the Word made flesh. But my point with us tonight is we cannot look to politicians to be a savior of a nation. We can only look to God. And tonight, my challenge to you as we go through this little study is what is your role and what is my role as a believer in this matter of what the future of our nation is going to be. If you feel like casting a vote was your uh, act of salvation and righteousness, then you really don't have an idea of how much our world needs salt and light. Right? Matthew chapter 5. So let me walk you through a little bit. Um, for over a century... American schools have adopted and instructed our children under a humanist dogma. How many of you have studied humanism or you have a knowledge of it? Okay. So I've, I've done it many times over the years. But I think, I thought it would be good tonight as a Wednesday night crowd to just back up and say, okay, what is the religion of our culture? It is not Christianity. The religion of our culture is humanism. It's socialism. It's on the pathway to Marxism, if we're not already there. And so a lot of the things that we are observing in our world today is driven by a humanist dogma that has really been uh, seeding its way into our culture. And I, I would go to the 60s, but I really think it goes all the way back maybe to the 1920s, 1930s. Some would go all the way back to Marx and, uh, and his writings. But let me keep going, and then I'll give you an opportunity to uh, uh, be a part of this. Humanism, then, is a philosophy of life that is atheistic and man-centered. So humanism rejects God and the scriptures. So you have to write, as, as we're looking at the culture that is around us, we're looking at a culture that thinks like heathen. Now, I grew up in a culture in the 50s and 60s that had a little bit more of a biblical orientation. But even then, we were already moving fast as a culture. Uh, churches, uh, uh, denominations with, uh, with seminaries were already infiltrated by atheists, people that were denying the faith, all the way back to really the 1800s. It, it had already begun. Uh, for instance, uh, Yale and Harvard, those were all founded to be schools uh, for, to produce preachers. I don't know if you realize that. What's some of the others? Um, Yale, Harvard, what are the others that were? Huh? Princeton? Huh? Dartmouth? Was it? I didn't know that. Brown? Okay. So you guys, uh, it's been a while since I've gone back and looked. But it's interesting that the Ivy League schools today, in their charter, were schools to produce preachers. That was their charter. That was their purpose. That was their founding. So you can imagine how far we have gone. And of course, we keep drifting. So humanism rejects God and the scriptures. Uh, and here's a quote by Dr. Tim LaHaye. Uh, was it a uh, late great planet Earth? Am I getting that right, Ted? Okay, uh, 1960s, I believe. So he wrote a book uh, back in the 60s, Humanism is Man's Attempt to solve his problems independently of God. And so this whole thing with dealing with humanism started really back in the 1950s as far, or 1960s as far as uh, churches becoming aware that there was a new religion. So uh, I, I really often try to avoid using the word Christianity. I, I believe we are biblical 
uh, people of biblical faith. Christianity is a very broad term now. Almost every cult in America now is, quote, calling themselves Christian. But we are biblical believers. That's who we are. We are Bible believers. And so we don't look to the churches for tradition. I'm going to keep moving. Humanism is evolutionary and it rejects the creator. And so then we would have to go all the way back to the 1920s when evolution was introduced into the public school system and how it began to infiltrate. I remember in uh, around probably mid-1960s, uh, uh, my coming home with a book that had evolution in it. And it had this evolving from, well, in my little book, I remember evolving from the monkeys and, and slowly over eons and eons and eons, suddenly there became man. And I remember my mom and dad were appalled. You know, it's like, because they did not grow up in that culture. I was growing up in a culture that was teaching evolution. Now, some of you are older than I am. Uh, did you experience the same thing that maybe your parents were shocked when you came home with a book and it was teaching evolution? Right? Yeah. All right. Thirdly, uh, humanism is amoral and rejects absolutes. What does that mean, amoral? No morals at all. Uh, no good, no evil, uh, no moral, no immoral. It's just, it rejects everything. It's, it is a rejection of absolutes. So in our, in our nation right now, and I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not really wanting to be in, about, it's not about the politics tonight. It's not, not at all, but I want us to understand that there is in, in our nation, a, uh, uh, two rails, if you would. One rail is humanism, and there's another rail that is uh, I would say our, our, our historically our biblical fundamental faith. And those rails are getting wider and wider and wider. And would you believe my phone's ringing? I always try to remember to put, put it on the airplane. What's it called? Airplane mode? It was an 800 number too. It's probably a scam, right? All right, moving on. All right. Rejects absolute. So think about this in our culture and, and talking about the politics of, of the of our nation right now. I don't know what the percentage would be right here on this uh, PowerPoint, but the percentage of our politicians, of of our colleges and our schools and our media. Uh, our corporate America, what, what, wonder what the percentage would be that this is really who they are. This is how they think. And it's so anti to how you and I think. Would you agree uh, in, in your experience of looking at the world around us? This is the world. This is how they're thinking. And so when we're looking at politicians and, and they're running for office and, and all of this, What's the percentage that this is who they are? They are humanists. They reject God. They reject the scriptures. They're evolutionary. They reject the creator. They are immoral. They reject absolutes. And I'm going to make a comment to you. Uh, 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 one, one of the things, and I'm not, I'm not worried about Republican or Democrat. I, I don't care about that right now. My point I wanted to make to you tonight, though, is that I think even the Republican Party, if you want to see them as the moral party, they're very compromised now. You know, they really, they're very compromised. The planks that you and I would recognize historically as Bible believer planks, they're all gone. Are you aware of that? Yes. They were stripped out. They're all gone. And so right now you, we have a two-party system and neither one of them are biblical faith, uh, a biblical, biblical faith platform. So we're really looking at a system now that is everything that is listed up here in a practical sense, whether it's in a profession sense at all. Anybody got a comment? You want to jump in before I keep going? Ted?
Right. Uh, deconstructionism, right? They, they want to tear apart the constitution. Right, yeah. right. And, and so uh, they're not going to be satisfied until they do that. And so they, we still have the act of those guidelines, but just as you're saying, Republican and Democrat get both. They, they, they fought into that line of thinking of being right. fully enabled to question all of it. Yeah, right. So we're, we're, we are, I think we're living at an at a exciting and a pivotal time. But if there's going to be hope for America, it must be revival. It's not going to be politics. Yeah. I was just going to say regarding humanism, my way of thinking, it goes all the way back to the garden. Mm -hmm. When Satan said to me, question God. Have God said So we're living in a culture of deception, right? Let me keep going. I, I give you a little bit more. Humanism holds a socialist one world view. You probably know that without me telling you that. But um, humanism rejects uh, national identities. Okay, so they, they, re, they reject uh, a national identification. I'll give you, a, for instance, the European Union. The European Union, the, the countries of the European Union have, have realized too late that they gave away their sovereignty. And now they have this entity, uh, this parliament, that really none of the people elected the, that parliament. But now the, the nations of Europe ceded their national sovereignty to this European Union. And the concept was, well, I tell you what, we're going to get rid of all the borders. We're going to get rid of your gold or your uh, currency. And we're just going to all live under this one economy. Uh, Britain has pulled out of that. I don't know if others have yet or not. But what they've done is give away not just their sovereignty, but they've given away their cultural identity as well. Then what they didn't see happening is that they were going to experience an immigration of millions and millions and millions coming up out of the Middle East, working their way up through Turkey, and then working their way all the way through to Europe. Because there are no boundaries and there's no national identity, they have assimilated themselves into the European culture. That is the fulfillment of a socialist one world view. It is a world that has no borders. Back up four years and look at the United States. That is the trajectory that we've been on is one world view and no borders. It, it, it is intentional. It is purposeful. And uh, it'll be interesting in the days ahead if we can come back from that. Uh, can I keep going? All right, here's another then. Humanists are the enemy of everything that made America great. I wanted to put that before you as a thought. And I'll give you some thoughts that are not on your outline there. Uh, they are openly intolerant of biblical Christianity. Uh, they are adversaries to the church, adversaries to the scriptures, adversaries to Bible believers. They are at war with Christianity, its biblical absolutes, and its moral principles. Now think about that. So we're, we're in the midst of a cultural war. There's no denying it. The question is, are we going to be salt and light in a culture that refutes and rejects everything that you and I hold dear and we believe in and under the umbrella of biblical Christianity? Here's another. Humanists are entrenched in politics, academia, 
media and corporations. Uh, they have been actively undermining the traditional family unit, father, mother, sons, and daughters. They have been actively uh, eroding traditional marriage, defined as one man and one woman. And they are enemies of what I would call patriotism, or somebody, might, somebody else might would say, or nationalism. That is, that is the world that we're in now. We're living in this world. And I say again to us, you know, this whole thing of MAGA or make America great again. We will not be great until we're good. And we will not be good until we turn back to the Lord. And so I want to prove that to you tonight. If you have your Bible there, uh, Romans chapter 1, and we're going to go through that in a moment. But I want to, t Ted mentioned our founding fathers. So I wanted to give you the principles and precepts of our founding fathers. They, this is what they believed. This is why the Constitution is written and the Declaration of Independence is written in the way that it is. It was fundamentally based upon what they believed. I'm not saying that they were all Bible believers. Some were not, but many of them were. So let me walk you through that. To be great, America must return to her spiritual foundation. By the way, this is the first. I'll do another, a second part two next week on this next Wednesday. So let me uh, go through this. Um, uh, John Witherspoon, God grant that in America, true religion and civil liberty may be inseparable. Now see, somebody tonight might would, or listening online might would be offended that I'm talking politics of the church. But the founding fathers said, now, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Religion and civil liberty, they go together. They are inseparable. Here's another, Benjamin Franklin. Now, Benjamin Franklin was not an angel. If you read some of his biography, uh, in the earlier years of his life, he was, a, he was a rascal, but he was brilliant. In the latter years of his life, he said this, I have lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of man. So if you had met Franklin in his early life, you would have said he's a reprobate. He's brilliant, but he's a rascal, right? But towards the end of his life, his concept and outlook changed very much. Another, uh, statesman Daniel Webster, he was a little bit later than the founding fathers, but I wanted to present his quote. If we and our posterity neglect religious instruction and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us. They would not be surprised at what's happening in our nation today. Uh, Patrick Henry it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the Gospels of Jesus Christ. Uh, Patrick Henry was actually a preacher, so he was uh, a strong believer in his day. Another, George Washington. No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than people of the United States. So he's saying, I have seen God's hand on our nation. He goes on, he says, we ought to be no less persuaded that the propitious smiles of heaven cannot be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right, which heaven itself has ordained. He is speaking of the commandments and the laws is what he, he, is, he is writing of there. He goes on and he says, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and what? And the Bible. And so, you know, this is the founding father. This, these are his words. This is his conviction as our nation was established. And so Ted, uh, Ted Roach was so right that what our culture is facing right now and its leadership is a politicians that realize that the basis of our fundamental liberties is something that they have to tear apart in order to build a new society. You've heard of Brave New World, uh, you know, so th they know they've got to remove that. Uh, for the first time in all of my years, I, I've, I've heard uh, politicians, corporate leaders all saying that we have to silence 
the voices that we disagree with. I mean, we've been on that path uh, for quite some time. Bill Gates especially has outspoken uh, the uh, amendment, uh, the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. They, they hate that. That is the one thing that separates us from the rest of the world. We individually have the right to bear arms in these United States. And I believe that is what has kept the, the militant government at a distance from us. Uh, John Adams, second president of the United States, he writes, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government or any other. Now, when you pause and you think about that, it scares you. We have a system of government that is only able to govern people who are moral and religious and inadequate to govern any other. All right, take your Bible. And uh, I, I actually put you in uh, Romans 1. But before I do that, I want to invite you to go with me to Deuteronomy 6. And I want to lay a foundation. And again, we'll study some of this more, more thoroughly next week. But let me go through this. America cannot be great and continue down a path of immoral self-destruction. A nation will not be blessed while disobeying God's law and commandments. If you have your Bible, could you go to Deuteronomy 6? And this is what I believe has to take place if we are to become a nation that God will bless. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 1. And I'm, I'm going to read. You follow the Bibles in the pews there. Now, these are the commandments or the instructions, the statutes and the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. Moses telling uh, Israel that you might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. That thou mightest fear or reverence the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post uh, of thy house and on thy gates. Now I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to go back. As you look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, and, and this is Moses instructing the people, God giving him the word, and he's instructing the people. And he said, now when you go into the land that I'm going to give you, this is what you must do. These are the practices that you must do in order for you to be blessed. So let's look at, look at with me at Deuteronomy chapter uh, 6 for a moment. And you see three, three things in the, the first verse there that Israel was supposed to be teaching. What are they? Verse 1. The commandments, the statutes, which is the laws, and the judgments, which is the principles and the precepts. Those are the three things. Now, who was supposed to be doing this? The priest? The parents. The parents. And so it's the father and the mother who bear the responsibility to teach their children. Now, obviously, there's other people and uh, uh, pastors in the church, as it was here. You had priests and you had Levites. Uh, you had people that were uh, later on, they would be teaching in the synagogue. So there were people teaching and instructing. But the fundamental basis of what was to be taught was the commandments, the stages, and the judgments. And the ones to be doing the teaching were the fathers and the mothers. I believe, well, even a church like Hillsdale, we are too dependent on somebody else doing, as fathers and mothers, what we're supposed to be doing. And so we turn over the responsibility to pastors and Sunday school teachers 
But foremost, it's our responsibility as fathers and mothers. And so we ought to be students of the word, is my point. In verse 2, we're to revere the Lord, fear the Lord thy God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments. So it's interesting, as you go to verse 2, it's not just what you teach in verse 1, it's what you do in verse 2. And so for us here this evening, how many of us are not just hearers of the word, but we're doers of the word? And what we believe is, is shapes what we do. And then go to verse 3. And in verse 3, you see the promise. What's the promise in verse uh, 3? That it may be well with thee. Now, here's a question. Is it well with the United States right now? No. Because we have disobeyed the Lord. We haven't obeyed his word and we haven't taught our children. And then look at, if you would, just quickly uh, for me. And I wanted you to see the generations. Where was that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Look at verse 2 again. How many generations are to be affected by what they hear, what they receive, and what they teach? Right. Thou, thy son, and thy son's son. Three generations, right? That are to be affected by what we teach. My, my point I want to make to you tonight on, on this one point here is that until we get back to, as Bible believers, to doing what we ought to be doing, it really doesn't matter how much we lecture the world. Until we're doing what we ought to do. And when we do what we ought to do, then we'll be the light and the salt that we're supposed to be in Matthew chapter 5. Let me take you to another thought to go with that. Uh, God will only bless this nation as we obey and instruct our sons and daughters in the righteousness of God's law and his commandments. Here's a question, not, not to be a trick question. Does the law save? Does obeying and keeping the law, does that save a man? No, why? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. So we know that you're not saved by the keeping of the law. But what is the purpose of the law then that we should be teaching it and learning it? It'll keep us out of trouble, but it won't bring us. Uh, it, it's the conviction of the law and, and the work of God that brings us to salvation and our faith and trust in Christ. Right, right. Here's the point. If we don't teach people the law and the commandments, they really don't need God's grace. Or they don't realize they need God's grace. Maybe that's a better way to put it. Because the law and the commandments, they convict. When I was growing up, pastors would, uh, you know, in the revival churches and all, boy, they, I mean... They would come down so hard dealing with sin that, I mean, you would, you would almost tremble in the pew. Any of you ever experienced that, you know? And I look back on that and, and, the, and the power of the word. I think a lot of times it was the power of the man. But it ought to be the power of God's word that convicts us, that strikes us. Yeah, uh, Jean, you raised your hand. To bring us to salvation. Absolutely. Yeah, Jim? There's a story of Spurgeon preaching in his uh, big church that the people were so convicted they thought the floors were going to open up and they'd all go to hell. They were holding on to the pillars. His preaching was so powerful. Right. Well, and, and you know, in the, the two great awakenings in America, it was the same way. You may not realize it. It was, it was a, a great revival that led to the Revolutionary War. Are you aware of that? The, the fires of liberty were set fire in the pulpits of America's rural churches. It's where that, that came from. In fact, there were instances where a pastor would finish preaching, he would take off his robe, and he would go to war. And the men in the church would follow him to go to war. So our, our liberties were born out of a time of revival. Let me give you another thought. To be great, America must repent of her sins and return to God's laws and commandments 
is our moral foundation. I wonder how much the world would change, how much our nation would change if we unapologetically declared God's laws and God's commandments, God's moral laws, that we were unapologetic about it. If we were as bold in our faith as the world is in its wickedness, it would be interesting to see what God could do with his church. But instead, we've, I'm afraid, we have retreated rather than engaging the world. Moving on. We are no longer one nation under God. What do you think? Take your Bible. I'm going to get you to Romans and then I'm going to have to be quiet and sit down. Take, uh, go with me to Romans and I want to read and then we'll come back next week and finish this up. I wanted to take time to go through the Ten Commandments and I will do that next week. But if you would follow with me, we're just going to read Romans 1, 19 through 23. All right, here we, here we go. Let's read. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Unto who? Unto man. For the invisible things of him, of our God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, mankind, are without excuse. Now, here's the question. What is it that we clearly see that was made? Huh? Everything. The psalmist wrote, the heavens do what? Declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. We have a, a church member, I, I, Jonathan Thatcher. I don't know if some of you know him. He takes some of these most beautiful pictures of deep, deep space. Any of you ever seen some of his uh, pictures? Oh, well, you would. Yeah, sister-in-law. But you, you all, just the, the beauty of space, the creation that shows the handiwork of God. Let me take you a couple more verses. Uh, if you would look with me at verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. In other words, man knew God, he knew his creator, but because he denied God, he became more and more spiritually blind. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And I find it so striking that uh, we live in a world that almost worships wisdom. And yet the wisdom of whom and the wisdom of what? And, and, and in, in reality, it's foolishness. And then finally, and I, I will close. And we read, and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image, this meaning idols, may like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. And wherefore God also gave them up, he ceased to restrain them, to uncleanness, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. What we're reading here has come to pass in the United States. We have watched it. As it is unfolding. And it is going to get worse and worse. So I, I, I would agree with some of you. That I think that God has given us a reprieve. But I'm not foolish enough to think that we've experienced revival. Revival is going to begin in the hearts of men. It's going to begin in our churches. It's going to begin when fathers and mothers teach their sons and daughters. God's word, his law, and his commandments, and the fact that Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, died for your sins, according to the scriptures. That we would be bold in our faith. Next week, I'll pick up, I, I want to go through the Ten Commandments uh, to review them with you. I know that you probably know them, but I think it would be a good exercise. So